Our next presenter, Lisa DeVetter, Prost. Great. Well, thank you. So today I'm not going to be presenting on any research project. Um, rather, I'm going to be presenting on a trip that I had the opportunity to go on this summer with several other researchers as part of the International Society for Horticultural Science uh, Rubus and Ribe Symposium. So this is an organization and we meet every four years in different places around the world and it's a really great opportunity for us to um, exchange thoughts and ideas with other researchers and learn about production in different parts of the world. And so this is very much um, my opinion, someone who likes to travel a celebratory event, and that's why I titled it Prost, because Prost in German means like cheers, and it's a celebratory. And coming here today, uh, Chris Benedict asked if I would be able to share some of the highlights from this particular trip in Germany and Switzerland. So just to kind of give you an idea, too, of why we go on trips like these and what's the purposes, um, one is really learning. It gives us an opportunity to learn about new systems and ways problems are being addressed. And sometimes those problems are unique to that area, but there are opportunities to identify similar problems and learn different ways that, you know, solutions are being utilized and how that might be transferred here in our own systems. It's also a good opportunity to share information because as a global research community, we get to learn from others' trials and tribulations and whatnot. Also, uh, research doesn't happen in a vacuum. We have a lot of great coordination that happens here in the Northwest, but a lot of us also have international collaborators around the world. So having these opportunities to meet every four years in different places around the world allows us to um, coordinate research projects or identify shared research problems and start working together in a very collaborative fashion in an international context on those problems. And then I'd be remiss not to say it's also a lot of fun to get to go to these different locations around the world and Germany and Switzerland was no exception. And I said mostly because the time that we attended uh, this particular symposium, it was extraordinarily hot and humid. Um, and so there's a little screen capture here of uh, my cell phone. Oh, let me just look here. So if you can't see that, that says 99 degrees Fahrenheit. And I enjoyed going, but that particular day, I wished it was a cooler day. So I'm going to talk about two different farms because I have 15 minutes and just kind of point out the highlights so that you get the opportunity to see what we got to learn there. But the overall tour that we got to go on extended from June 23rd to June 25th. And we started um, our trip in Frankfurt, Germany. And the first farm that we visited was Farm Reinheimer in Gersheim, Germany. Uh, that DE stands for Deutschland. And then we visited several other farms and we got to see different types of caneberry production systems, both raspberry and blackberry, as well as different types of ribes crops. So red, uh, red, black, and goose, red and black currant and gooseberries. Um, Towards the end of our pre-symposium tour, we got to visit Farm Mueller in Steinburn, uh, Switzerland. And I'm going to highlight that particular farm because it was a very interesting and intensive operation. And then at the end of the tour, we had our symposium in Zurich. So you can kind of see the little stars. That's the route that we took as we moved south towards Germany and then we entered um, into Switzerland for our last tour stop and then the symposium. So I was a little confused when we first decided to go to Germany and Switzerland as a society because Germany and Switzerland weren't necessarily on my radar of top caneberry production um, areas in the world. Um, but they do have caneberry production. Um, and what I'm showing here is both raspberry and blackberry production. Um, these are the top 20 countries for raspberry and blackberry production. So raspberry, we have 2018 world production statistics in tons. And you can see the United States, um, according to these data, we rank fourth in the United States. And then following that, um, at uh, 18 and 16, we have Germany and Switzerland. And then for BlackBerry, uh, the most recent data came from some work that Bernadine Strick published. And I know there's other research efforts to try to estimate uh, global BlackBerry production as well as national BlackBerry production. But you can see according to 2005 data, um, this is production in metric tons. Uh, the United States ranks second, but we also have Germany and Switzerland in the top 20 countries. So there are things that we can learn from these production systems and they are significant produ um, producers uh, internationally. 
so let's start at Farm Reimheiner in Germany. Uh, this was a farm that was just south of Frankfurt, and they were primarily focusing on selling raspberry towards fresh for fresh market. Uh, it was a 300 acres farm, and the crops that they were growing, in addition to raspberry, include strawberry, potato, and rhubarb. Uh, the primary cultivars that they were growing there were tulamine, which is a floricane variety. Probably many of you are familiar with tulamine. And then the other one was a Ramatan type called Indorosa. And so this one, it's a primocane one, and it has the opportunity for them to produce a double crop. And that was really ideal for their production goals because what they're trying to do in this particular operation, which was similar to other operations that we had the chance to visit, was to try to achieve very consistent volume of high quality raspberries for the fresh market. And they were really targeting this production window from the 15th of May to the 15th of October because their buyers were expecting this very consistent volume of high quality fruit within this time frame. So some of the key production things that we noticed as we were visiting this particular farm that I thought would be interesting to share with you all is that they were growing the raspberries on raised beds and they were mulched with black polyethylene mulch, just like Juan was talking about in the previous presentation. Uh, they were fertigating, so these were fertigated systems and they irrigated utilizing um, water from the Rhine River. The production system is quite different um, there as opposed to here. Um, they are planting long cane plants, so they've already grown the primocanes, they're planting them um, in the winter time, and they are then jumping into the season with a floricane crop. So they skip that primocane production cycle because the nurseries are growing the primocanes and then they're growing the floricanes for its crop. And afterwards, they're done. They're removing those spent floricanes from the field and they're looking at replanting the following year. So very short production cycles compared to what we're doing here, maybe six years plus. They also are manipulating production through the use of tunnels. So they'll plant under tunnels to try to get early production so they can meet that May 15th start time for their production season and get some nice spring production. And then they'll also have production without tunnels so that they can have fruit in that mid to late June window and even a little bit later. Uh, someone who also does work with pollination uh, found it very interesting that they're utilizing bumblebees, not honeybees, for their pollination. And they also had quite a bit of refugia for pollinator habitat to help with pollination. Uh, what they're doing for harvesting, it's a daily hand harvest operation. And part of that is to try to get that uniform quality but they're also doing that because they don't necessarily have some of the agrochemical tools or the pesticide tools um, to control SWD. So frequent picking is one way that they can mitigate that for their production system. And also you'll see this on the next slide, but they grow their plants in a hedge system with mini trellis wires and they have the laterals extended on those um, wires because they want the fruit exposed and they want large fruit exposed, which is another reason why they have that short production time. Um, and that's really for picking efficiency. So labor is a concern there, and if they have high picking efficiency, then they can try to um, reduce some of those costs. And as I mentioned, these are long cane plantings, so they're growing floricanes for one year, removing them, and then looking at replanting them in December. So some of the challenges that they discussed um, during that visit, so one key pests and diseases that they're trying to manage, rust, spotted wing drosophila, aphids, and spider mites. So someone who looks at the Red Raspberry Commission priority list, these are ones that we see, and they're trying to manage it in an environment where they have a lot less pesticide tools. Labor was another one, which we also deal with as well. Uh, for them, they're paying about nine euros an hour for labor, and that's about $10 US dollars per hour. Uh, they maintain about 200 seasonal workers, and according to the farmer that we were visiting, that represents about 40 to 50 percent of their total production costs. So labor is a big concern for them, and they're looking for ways to have more efficient production systems. And, it, you know, I'd spent some time in Germany years prior, and it was interesting because it's changed in the sense that um, formerly where a lot of their labors would come from was from Turkey, but as that um, class has kind of moved up in the social realm, the social ladder, um, they're no longer taking these picking jobs, and now it's Romanians that are moving in and providing that labor force. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to point out, so you see those blue wires there. So those are the wires that they have the um, laterals extending out on, so the fruit's exposed for good picking efficiency. 
So now we're going to jump across the border. We're going to skip the other farms for the time being, and we're going to talk about Farm Mueller, and Matthias is the farmer there, and this is in Switzerland. So this is a very intensive production system. It's 34 acres, and they're growing raspberry, strawberry, blackberry, blueberry, currant, and gooseberry. And they also had some hazcap if Eric Gabrant's in the room, which was interesting. Um, the raspberry cultivars include Glen Ample, Bajolet, um, Langerai, and Kwanzaa. And the reason I wanted to highlight this is because they have a very intensive substrate production system. And they're also growing so that they're meeting the Swiss ecological performance test. So it's environmental compliance and there is a payoff that the government gives them for meeting certain environmental compliances. And their production goal is similar to Farn Reinheimer. It's consistent volume of high quality fruit for the fresh market. So I found the substrate production system very interesting. Um, so for the raspberry production, they're growing in a substrate that consists of coir, peat, and perlite, and they're growing them in about 12 liter pots. They're maintaining two fluoricanes per pot, and they're also doing um, the long cane production system. So they're buying primocanes from the nursery in the winter, and then right away they're going to be producing um, that fluoricane crop. Um, they are also looking at um, experimenting with starting their canes earlier in their greenhouses, which they have there, so they can have earlier production and try to capture that early market um, for their enterprise. And so this is a picture of one of their raspberry fields under the tunnel. You'll see that they have grass in the alleyway, and they're doing that as opposed to some type of um, fabric on the ground because um, they're trying to mitigate um, high temperatures, whereas their blackberry, which they've claimed was not as temperature sensitive, they had this black um, landscape fabric that they were utilizing to control weeds and then these troughs underneath for collection and recycling of the leachate that was coming from those pots. So some of the challenges that Matthias was experiencing at Mueller's farm, high labor, and here it was quite different in the sense that there they're paying 20 euros an hour which is about 22 US dollars per hour for their labor. And on their farm, which again is 34 acres compared to the other one which was 300, they have 130 to 140 workers during their peak season, which is July to August. So they have a lot higher land costs, um, uh, a lot higher labor costs. In addition, land costs and insurance costs is very um, expensive in Switzerland. However, um, they're not in the EU, so they have their own tariff system, which allows during production seasons, traditional Swiss crops, which includes strawberry and raspberry to be sold. And so they have an advantage in the marketplace, even though their product is higher. They're not necessarily competing with fruit that's coming from other countries. Um, and then the other problem that they articulated was mutations, which might be coming from some of their nursery material. So some of the other crops that we got to see, just um, they're not necessarily that economically important for Washington State, but I did want to highlight them just to show that what we, we had the opportunity to see and to learn. Um, we got to see some red currant production, which you see here. Um, and then we also got to see gooseberry production, which Germany is the global leader in gooseberry production. Um, and there, a lot of the they're looking for is that red blush for fresh market, uh, which was interesting because here gooseberries oftentimes were green colored fruit. And then they also at Farm Mueller, they had um, tabletop strawberry production. And so I just wanted to highlight that in the time frame that I have, um, this was some other things that we got to see on this particular trip. So in conclusion, um, you know, trips like these are really great cross-cultural learning experiences, and they're not just limited to um, researchers. Growers also have the opportunity to go. In fact, in 2023, um, this particular group, Rubus and Ribes, will be meeting here in the Northwest. So you have an opportunity to come here, here in the Northwest, and also to interact with some potentially growers and researchers from around the nation and take part of this experience. Some of the other themes, there's intensive fresh market production there, different than our production system where we're mostly processing. Uh, very short planting longevity with their long cane production systems, but that's intentional for them to achieve their yield, the fruit size, and in turn the high picking efficiency so that they can minimize some of the labor costs with picking. Similar to here, labor costs are a challenge for them and availability is becoming a challenge for them as well. They also have, as I mentioned, fewer pesticide tools for them to manage uh, pests and diseases. 
and the other one that I heard surface a couple of times too, particularly might have been the situation because of the high temperatures we we're experiencing, but adaptation to climate change and dealing with these higher temperatures um, in these areas. So this was um, a challenge that they vocalized um, for their production systems. So I mentioned um, ISHS Rubus Ribes 2023 is going to be here in the Northwest, both Washington State and in Oregon State. Uh, both Dave Brell and myself are the conveners. So um, it's a great opportunity for you to attend and learn internationally what's being done in both Rubus and Ribus research. So I encourage you to mark your calendars and attend. So in conclusion, danke schön and ergewende Fragen. That's thank you and any questions. Yeah. So the question was, what are they doing with all of their planting media? So um, Matthias uh, Mueller, he mentioned that in some cases they try to recycle it, um, but sometimes also they're looking at discarding it as well. So there is an effort to recycle. And then there was also some effort to look at alternatives um, uh, like compost. There was some research presented on that that you know might be some good soil amendments after they're, they're done with it. But a lot of it is, ends up being discarded. Mm -hmm. okay. Tom. The, the bumblebee pollination mm -hmm. and setting aside areas for bumblebee habitat. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The, the bumblebee pollination and setting mm -hmm. aside areas for bumblebee habitat mm -hmm. it sounds like it wouldn't be very efficient or consistent. Yeah. Do they bring in hives, any managed bees at all? Yeah, so Tom's question clarifying about pollination with bumblebees and habitat. So there are two separate activities. So they are bringing in bumblebees from commercial producers, and that is one avenue that they get pollination services. But in addition to that, they also um, will have some, ha they had some habitat at Farn Reinheimer for bumblebee pollination. But for the farm in Switzerland, um, they're mostly utilizing, um, they're not utilizing native habitat given their production system. They're utilizing bumblebees for pollination there. And again, they're commercially brought in. Yeah. Okay. Um, for, the, for the pot production, are the growers uh, preparing their own canes or I thought you mentioned that the nurseries are supplying the canes? Yeah, so the question about long canes was where are they coming from? So most of the farms that we visited were getting long canes from, from nurseries. They weren't producing them on their own. All right, All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, we have a, a break now until four. And then we'll reconvene in here at four for our last session of